Hello everybody, Alan Jack Sparrows here and greetings from my Mudcut Studios in Milford, Pennsylvania. For this week's vlog, we're going to post part two, which is actually the first half of the interview, whatever, um, of our session and interview with Peter Dannenberg, uh, Grammy Award winning producer from the Spin Doctors. Uh, so check it out. Peace. Hello everybody, Alan Jack Sparrows here and greetings from SUNY Purchase Studio A. I'm here with the chair of the studio department, Peter Dannenberg. Peter, how did you wind up here? Well... Let's see, I've been here for about uh, 11 years or so, actually now, maybe 12. Uh, but prior to that, around 1979, I was finishing up high school. And uh, I had a band, and we wrote original music, and we liked to try and record original music. And a bunch of us uh, pitched in and bought one of the first 8-track consumer tape recorders which in 1979 or so was a Tascam 80-8 machine. Eight tracks on half-inch tape. Nice. I think they were like $4,000 or something in, in, in 1979 dollars. It was a that's, lot of money. It's a good chunk of change. So a bunch of us pitched in and bought it together. And we had a bunch like PA equipment, microphones, and mixers. And we would take turns setting up at different people's parents' houses. So we would set up the drums in the basement, and then we would run riders wires like up the outside of the house into, oh, yeah. into an open up window the stairs, yeah. and build a control room and it would take about depending on the, the people's parents it would take maybe a week or two to get kicked out of these houses once and for all so eventually when we when we worked our way through everyone's parents and friends houses we realized that we had to get our own place to do this so so we we rented a old burnt out taxi stand nice. and opened our first studio primarily the idea was to record our bands but rent was expensive, and the new equipment that we kept wanting was expensive. Still is. So we would um, we would try and find other people to record to pay us so that we could have the newest gear. Nice. And so before we even opened the studio, we went and found people. We would go out to clubs and we'd say, hey, we're going to open a recording studio. For $1,000, you can have 100 hours of time as long as you pay in advance. <laughs> And we had takers. So, so what was that? Ten bucks an hour, right? Yeah. It was a good deal. It's a lot of One time. of the takers was Harold Danko, who actually is a, a pretty uh, famous, respectable jazz pianist. And and, uh, and so we got a few takers, and that's how we, we generated the initial money we needed to open the uh, studio. So that studio opened in 1980. That was in the Red Recording. And our first session ever at that studio uh, was... Uh, the day we turned the lights, the power on for the equipment and ran it for the first time, it was uh, uh, a singer-songwriter named John Waite, who was writing music with Ivan Kral, who was from Patti Smith and the Iggy Pop group. And they traded us a whole bunch of microphones and other equipment for the time, and so that's like where we got our first Neumann mics and so Sweet. on when we opened the place. And so then new technology kept arriving, like, like this, this newfangled thing called digital technology came out in the 80s. Yeah. Perhaps you've heard of it. I have. And so uh, we needed this reverb that would go every time you hit the snare drum. That was pretty exciting. We couldn't do that with our spring reverb. And so that was a Lexicon 224. That was the first digital reverb we wanted. I'm not familiar with that one. But yeah. Well, in 1981 or two dollars, it was twelve thousand dollars for a. I believe it was an eight-bit wow. digital reverb, maybe eight. twelve-bit. <laughs> Lo-fi but hi-fi at the time. Yep. Wow. But that gave us our boosh, snare drum sound. We had to have that to be competitive, and it just went on from there. Uh, we then graduated to a 16-track tape recorder, an old Ampex machine, came out of Delta Recording in Manhattan. We moved to the other side of the train tracks and, and merged with another company briefly who, who was doing video work. They went out of business. We rented the rest of the floor um, and had opened a studio called Acme. It was right around that merger when the video company was leaving that I met uh, Dr. Joe Ferry, who uh, later was teaching here at Purchase College and introduced me to this scene. And we started a record company called uh, SOS Records and proceeded to make... Joe would just sit there at the desk looking out the window at the, at the water and at the boats. And I would go to him and say, Joe, we need a record to make. You know, rent's coming. And he would just, like, look out the window and think of something and make some phone calls and, and 
basically just scare up work. And there we, was. And we made some of my favorite recordings. Actually, my favorite recording that I ever made was one of those records. It was a tune that was on one of the Bluesiana Triangle records. We made two of those records, one with Art Blakey. Uh, who else was on that? Uh, uh, David Fathead Newman. Dr. John. Dr. John. Dr. John. <clears throat> and there was a, a track that uh, Will Calhoun, drummer from Living Color, wrote called Blues Parody. No. Love's Parody. Yeah. That was on one of those records that's mm. one of my favorite recordings was just recorded live hmm. off the floor at the studio there so we made those records we made a lot of like uh you know modern sort of fusion records with the great players from new york like glenn anthony alexander. jackson and glenn alexander glenn alexander records and and uh, all the great horn players chris Bode. came through here like chris Bodie, michael davis and andy snitzer and Anthony Jackson and Mike Stern. I mean, all these guys were coming through playing on these records that Joe was putting together. And there was probably 25 of them or more. Yeah. So uh, that was going on, and I was still doing this sort of rock records. I had the very first session, back when you talk about Ivan Kral and John Waite, they brought a drummer in named Frankie LaRocca, who played on some of these demos with them. Frankie went on to... Frankie was originally played drums in uh, Scandal and the New York mm -hmm. Dolls and uh, played later with Brian Adams. And he played on that John Waite song. Uh, um, missing You. Every Missing You, right. Yeah. Which was a, was one of John Waite's big hits. Yeah. So Frankie went on to be an A&R guy. And he worked at Atlantic for a while. And then he moved over to Epic Records. And he signed a band called the Spin Doctors, and the Spin Doctors had been recording, but they Frankie wanted them to record again, and we took them in the studio, and recorded their pocket full of kryptonite record. It was the same as the records I made with Joe all the time. I was making records with Frankie all the time. Usually with Frankie, it was some band that was signed to the label already. They didn't really like the record, and then we would go in the studio and fix it up or redo it with them. 